Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. My name is Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video number four. We're in chapter two, part two. So last time we discussed uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, vocabulary around a frequency table, and we gave you the example of a frequency table, which we're going to create here in just a minute. So it's Again, important for you to know these terms, not that you can uh, tell me the definition, but that you understand uh, what's being said when they're used. And so we're going to continue on uh, discussing frequency tables. In fact, we're going to make one. And then we're also going to make a relative frequency table while we're at it. So if you recall, a frequency table uh, takes um, data that is quantitative and it groups it into these classes that are non-overlapping intervals. And non-overlapping intervals are uh, called a partition when they uh, break up the whole data set and you have each value in only one class. So that when you add up the frequencies, you get the total number of uh, values in the data set. So here is the instructions on how to do or make a frequency table. I'm not going to go over these uh, you know, as they're written. Instead, I'm going to use them uh, to make the frequency table. I think that's more effective than reading this off to you. Um, I hope you will put this in your notes so that you have this and you can follow this um, and when you're doing your homework. Um, so it'll make it easier. All right. So... Let's get started. Here's our example. We've got uh, these distances in miles uh, for one way of commuting. Um, these for people that work in Dallas, Texas, downtown Dallas, Texas, and how far they work. So the first thing that we need to do here is we need to decide how many classes we're going to have for the data set. Well, this is actually not as simple as it may seem. Uh, to get the right number of classes, you usually have to uh, do some trial and error. So to keep you from having to do that, in this course, I will always tell you how many classes I want the data to have. So that takes that uh, pretty tough, actually, decision away from you having to consider. All right, a little less stress for you. So in this data set, I want six classes. So six classes. So the next thing that's very important for us to calculate is the class width. And this is going to be the max value, which I've already circled here for you or highlighted, minus the minimum value. Again, I already highlighted that for us. Divided by the number of classes, which is 6. And so this is 46 over 6, and this turns out to be 7.6, and the 6 is continue. The rule says that no matter what number I get here, I always increase it to the next whole number. So this is going to go to 8. So even if I had gotten 7, a whole number, I would still increase it to 8. Otherwise, I'll end up with more than eight, uh, 6 classes. So you don't want that. All right, so we're going to start with our class limits, and we're going to get the lower and upper class limits. Remember, we need six of these. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the smallest value in the data, which was a one. And I'm going to add the class width to it, which gives me a nine, and then a 17, and then a 25, and then a 33, and then a 41. And those are six numbers, so that means I have six classes. Now I need to get the upper limits. Well, I'm going to take, the easiest way is to take this second class, lower class limit, and subtract a 1 from it. And that gives me an 8. So now, since I'm only dealing with whole numbers, I can have values between 1 and 8. And if it's a 9, it goes to the next class. So now I can take this 8 and add 8 to it, because 8 is our class width, as we see up there. So that gives me 16, 24, uh, 32... 40 and 48 and my lower class limit of the first class needs to be equal to the minimum value which is 1 and this last number here needs to be at least as large if not larger than the maximum value in my data which in this case is 47 so this is 48 so all the values are going to fall within one of these classes then to get our class boundaries what we do is we subtract a half, or 0.5, from our lower boundary here. So 1 minus 0.5 gives me 
and then I add 0.5 to the upper class limit, which gives me 8.5. So I could either do that for all the classes here, or I can again add my class width to each of these. So I get 8.5, 16.5, uh, 24.5, uh, 32.5, and 40.5. And then I do the same thing for the upper uh, class boundaries. So 16.5, 24 uh, 40 0.5 and 48.5. Notice that I have a lot of repeats of the boundaries. So the upper class boundary for the first class is the lower class boundary for the second class. Okay, and there are seven unique values of boundaries. I have six classes and seven values because I have one before the first class and one after the last class. Okay, so now that we've got that set up, we're ready to tally. And what we do here is we simply go to each of the values, and you can either choose to go across or down. I'm just going to do some of these. So I'm going to take the first number, which is a 13, and so that's going to go in the second class, and I'm going to tally a mark there. Then I go to 7, which is going to fall into the first class, and I have a mark here. The next number is 12 which goes into the second class, then a 6, first class, and then a 34 is going to go to this fifth class. So 34, we go here, and we keep on doing this, okay? So it turns out that we have, uh, I'm not going to continue doing that. I think you can figure out how to do it, but uh, when you get to 5, you do uh, a cross mark every 5, and it turns out that we have... Um, 14, oops, I can keep going, I have plenty of room. So we have 14, then we have uh, 21, and let's look back up here at the table. Uh, 11, 6, 4, and 4. And if we add these up, these total frequencies had best equal the total number of values in our data set. And we have 10 across and 6 down. So 6 times 10 is 60, and this matches. So now, how do we calculate our relative frequency? Well, the relative frequency is equal to the frequency over n, which is our total number of data values. And so I'm going to draw a line here across. And so we tally the, or we total the frequency, um, and these F's, again, are frequency, and so 60 is the N. So all of these values for this table are going to be F over 60. And so I have 14 divided by 60, and I'm going to uh, round this to three decimal places, which gives me 2.33, and then I have 21 divided by 60, and that's 0.35. Now, the rule of thumb is that we will round these to three decimal places unless we tell you otherwise. So if I'm rounding to three decimal places, my calculator just spits out the 0.35, I need to add the zero to the end in order to uh, make these numbers look the same so it looks professional, all right? So I expect you to do the same thing. All right, 183. And then this is going to be, if I divide 6 into 60, I get a 0.1. So again, I need to add the two zeros to make it three decimal places. And then this is 0 0.067 and 0 0.067. And it turns out nicely that in this case, the total adds up to three decimal places to 1. Now, the relative frequencies always add up to 1, but sometimes because of rounding error, we have, um, it may... Uh, seem to add up to a number that's slightly different than 1. But again, that's due to rounding error. So it's always important to put a 1 down here and the right number of decimal places. Okay, so the only thing that's left to do is our class midpoint. And the book says that we need to take the lower plus the upper limits, class limits, and divide by 2. We're taking the average of those. So we'll do the same thing. 1 plus 8 divided by 2. 9 divided by 2 equals 4.5. Whoops. All right. 
So this first one is 4.5. And the easiest thing I think to do is then add the class widths to this number rather than calculate the average for each one of them. So 8 and 4 is 12.5, 20.5, 28.5, 36.5 and 44.5 by adding 8, adding our class width to each of these numbers. So we have now completed making our frequency table and relative frequency table. A relative frequency table has this column in addition to the other columns. So all the other columns make up a frequency table. By adding this column, we make it a relative frequency table. So why do we use a relative frequency table? Why would we use that? Well, when we're making uh, comparisons between more than one sample, if I have 60, let's say that instead of doing all 60 here, let's say that 40 of these were males and 20 were females. If I wanted to compare the frequencies from 40 males to 20 females, it wouldn't be a fair comparison because I have twice as many males in the sample as I do females. But if I took each of those and divided by the uh, number of values in each of those samples, say 40 and 20 for the females, then, um, then I would have relative frequencies and I can compare those values uh, one to one. So I don't have to do anything. I could look at uh, the proportion of women who travel between 1 and 8 miles and the proportion of men who travel between 1 and 8 miles, and I can compare those without any problems. But if I'm comparing the frequencies, then there is an issue because I don't have as many females in that sample as I do males. All right. So that is how we make a relative frequency table and a frequency table. So please don't forget to scan in your notes by midnight on the due date for this uh, video. Remember to make them neat. Uh, I always say that it's extra points, but I'm joking. It's really for you so that you can read your notes and use them to do homework and to study for the test. Also, uh, you're welcome to add to your formula sheet the um, calculation up here for class width. The formula is... Um, given here. And again, you're welcome to put the formula for uh, relative frequency. So any formulas are fair game for your formula sheet. Uh, if you have any questions or something here wasn't clear, please come to our virtual office hours. Uh, if those hours uh, don't work for you or you need an answer before then, by all means, please email me. I am happy to help you and I will see you next time. Until then, think statistics.